So to help motivate this session, um, I thought I'd start with just a few observations and examples. Um, then I'll introduce a framework for thinking about um, interagency, in, rather intra-agency coordination um, in general in terms of how agency heads design their internal rulemaking structures and procedures. And then I'll try to apply this framework to the specific problem of deep uncertainty. So by way of motivation, uh, my first example comes after the 2010 Deepwater Horizon oil spill, when the um, Department of Interior Secretary, Ken Zalazar, um, announces the agency's third major restructuring. Okay, so whereas before the Mineral Management Service was just a unitary agency, um, Secretary Salazar decides to split MMS into two bureaus. Okay, the first would be the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, which would be charged with conducting risk analyses, doing the environmental and economic impact analyses. And the second bureau uh, would be the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, which would be charged with ostensibly using the analyses to engage in enforcement, whether it's permitting or investigations. And then in, in addition, um, this restructuring also created this external entity, the Offshore Energy Safety Advisory Committee. Okay, and as part of the announcement, Secretary Salazar says, um, this is going to promote independence within the agency, and it's also going to help prevent, uh, in the future, things, disasters like the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. Um, environmentalists criticized Secretary Salazar, um, basically claiming that it didn't go far enough, that there should be more independence, and their basic criticism was that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management would still be under the c direct control of the head of MMS, and not enough would be um, entrusted to this external entity, the Offshore Energy Safety Advisory Committee. My second example um, comes from um, a, a case familiar to many in this room um, of what happened at the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC, after the DC Circuit struck down the SEC's proxy access rule in a case called Business Roundtable in 2011. What did the SEC commissioners do organizationally? Well, first, they issued for the first time in their entire history a guidance document that would standardize the agency's approach to cost-benefit analysis. Secondly, for the first time, they also granted what's known as clearance authority to the SEC's chief economist. Okay, and clearance authority is essentially, you can think of it like a soft veto. Okay, so in other words, when the rulemaking is being drafted within the agency, for the first time, the chief economist actually has a say in the final product. Many observers have claimed that this has contributed to the SEC's ability to avoid uh, reversal by the DC Circuit. Um, many of these observers cite um, a recent case in 2014 which basically heaped a lot of praise on the SEC's cost-benefit analysis as evidence that these internal reforms have had some um, successful effects. So both of these examples, I'd submit, are examples of um, intra-agency coordination, okay, the power that agency heads have, again, to design these structures and procedures to process the internal information that's required to draft these regulations that require the sustained coordination of lawyers, right, preamble writers, um, scientists, economists doing the cost-benefit analyses, um, and of course the, the multiple political appointees often at an agency um, that have, um, by all accounts, thickened uh, across time. And one basic hypothesis is that as uncertainty increases, defined as essentially the amount of information that the agency head requires to shepherd the rule successfully through political review, OIR review, as well as judicial review. As that amount of information increases, the agency head is going to have an incentive to basically restructure, reorganize, um, in order to decrease the coordination costs of getting access to that information within the agency. And I submit that the same thing is going to occur um, even when you hold these external constraints constant and the agency head's own informational priorities change. Okay, so for example, um, say you have an FDA commissioner that cares a lot more about what the White House thinks relative to, say, the DC Circuit. Okay, they're also going to change their um, internal structures to reflect the, these new priorities. Okay, they're going to do that, again, by decreasing information coordination costs. Of course, the ability to um, engage in this kind of reorganization restructuring um, itself is going to be constrained. 
First, it's going to be constrained by just the implementation costs of trying to reorganize an agency, right? Bureaucrats are notoriously resistant to change. And um, these costs have to be outweighed by the benefits that they're going to receive by reorganizing accordingly, okay? Whether that's in terms of bureaucratic autonomy or reputation, um, you know, Secretary Ken Salazar, Salazar um, also um, had supporters in the reorganization as well, okay? So his efforts likely reflected um, those benefits gained. So why care about interagency coordination? You know, what's at stake, if anything? Uh, well, the first reason to care about this question I submit is that um, by contrast to administrative laws, just overwhelming focus on external controls um, imposed by both the President and Congress, well, there's a lot more to be said about the internal controls within administrative agencies that probably affect, um, on the day-to-day -day level, um, how agency actors themselves believe themselves to be constrained. That is, they're going to be caring about the internal hierarchies of the agencies, their own operating manuals, the norms of the agency, um, probably much more, again, at the granular level than um, presidential and congressional constraints. And these institutional roles matter. Okay, so to use a phrase that's often you know, used in DC is, you know, you have to stay in your lane. Okay, you have to stay in your lane in terms of what institutional role you have. So for example, um, if you're a policy analyst with a JD or some legal background um, reviewing a regulation, nobody cares what your opinion is on the legal aspects of the rule, right? Your institutional role is just to talk about the um, analysis of the policy within the regulation itself. Um, other stakes, well, there's a positive aim here um, to try and explain variations in organizational structures and processes across time. Why do particular administrative, um, why do particular um, administrators engage in particular kinds of changes versus others? And then this question also raises a number of normative concerns. First about transparency, so witness what happened, for example, with the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, and its recent net neutrality regulations, right? There's been lots of criticism that the entire rulemaking process was opaque, right? Did the commissioners vote on uh, a particular draft of the net neutrality rule? Why did it take so long for it to actually be made public? Um, one of the FCC commissioners has actually written an entire blog post saying, we need to make our rulemaking procedures transparent, and in fact, we should codify it in the Code of Federal Regulations. Okay, so there's a, a real concern about what it is that agency heads are doing when they're structuring their rulemaking um, processes. There's also a concern that these structures and processes can be used to evade kinds of, the kinds of oversight that we traditionally favor, whether it's legislative or presidential oversight. For example, um, say you have a, a president that wants a regulation um, that would help foster um, increased oil drilling. Say you have an agency head that wants to resist the president's directive. Well, the agency head can probably assign that rulemaking um, assignment to a really dysfunctional bureau within the agency. Okay, and cite, say, resource constraints, presidential priorities, maybe take the hit on poor management, and therefore, perhaps, um, again, subvert uh, the president's priorities. And then finally, there's a concern about um, the politicization of expertise. Okay, that if there's too much centralization, for example, that the agency head might be able to you know, influence what the, the scientists would have independently um, determined with respect to particular uncertainty analyses. Okay, so the question that I hope to pose for discussion is, um, how should agency heads process information under these conditions of deep uncertainty? Uh, the first in terms of the structural decisions that agency heads can make the first decision they can make is how to centralize what I've called the uncertainty analysts, or the people um, preparing the cost-benefit analyses, the risk assessments, and so on, um, within the agency. So one example of this uh, is the EPA's National Center for Environmental Economics, which is housed within the office of the administrator. But I submit that's, a, that's an example of um, what I would call centralization, right? Where everything is just unitary and placed within the top level administrator's office. Okay, so this would be just in that one box at um, the MMS. Okay, another possibility is they can um, internally separate the uh, uncertainty analysts from the decision makers. Okay, you might call this interagency separation. 
So again, you know, visually the example would be, you know, have these two different bureaus, okay? And um, an example of this is the SEC itself, which has started to design its agency in, the, in this way. The Division of Economic and Risk Analysis, um, otherwise known as DIRA, is independent from the SEC commissioners, okay? And many people praise this as a positive step because it's allowing more independence. And then the final design choice structurally is you could have the actual uncertainty assessments done outside of the agency itself. Okay, so again, you know, look at my, just visually, it's the advisory committee model, which is completely independent from the agency. And other examples of this model include the FDA, which often requests um, reports from the National Research Council, which is part of the National Academy of Sciences. And they actually asked them to create their risk characterization framework for decision making. Similarly, the Department of Homeland Security also often contracts out its terrorism related uncertainty analyses to private contractors like the Rand Corporation. Okay. Very briefly, I think that there are some um, normative structural trade offs um, in all of these models. Okay, the first dimension is simply, as I've alluded to before, the amount of control that the agency head has over the actual production of the uncertainty analysis. And of course, that decreases the more separated the uncertainty anal analysts are. Okay, and that allows for either blame shifting. Okay, so for example, consider um, the EPA with the Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, at one point in time was saying, look, the science is really uncertain when it comes to climate change. The agency head says, oh, we can't do anything about it. The IPCC told us that the science is really uncertain. Could also allow, on the flip side, for more validation, right? So if you think that the science is at a place where um, the agency head wants to be very active um, in regulating something, well, then you can get sign-off from the National Academy of Sciences. Say you've gone through peer review. Uh, maybe you want to do this with a social cost of carbon, okay, and therefore validate um, the uncertainty analyses and move forward. The second dimension is the kind of expertise that's going to result from these design choices. Okay, obviously, if it's centralized and more in-house to the agency, that expertise is going to be much more agency-specific, okay, in the sense that the people writing the uncertainty analyses and making the decisions are going to ha have a much better institutional awareness of the constraints on the agency, what the agency head is actually trying to accomplish, and therefore, perhaps tailor um, the uncertainty analyses accordingly, such that the decision has a higher probability of actually being informed by the analysis itself. By contrast, the more independent the uncertainty anal analysts become, you might get higher quality general expertise, because now you have this fancy panel at the National Academy of Sciences, um, drawn from you know, experts from all over the country. But that is going to be much more general. It might result in a 200-page report that's given to the agency head, who probably is not going to read it, right? They're going to get briefed by some staff members, going to give some kind of high-level bullet points. And there's some question about how much that's actually going to be absorbed um, into the decision-making process. Finally and relatedly, um, these structural um, decisions is also going to affect um, the kind of deliberation that's going to result, um, again, in terms of how these um, uncertainty analyses are incorporated into the decision-making process. Okay, so two uh, quick points on that. Um, agency heads' time is really limited. Okay, so um, the more there are opportunities for you know, informal interactions, right? The agency head you know, catches the analyst in the hall and is able to talk to them um, about the assumptions that they made, the more likely there's going to be um, actual deliberation occurring. And then there's also the um, problem of translation, tacit expertise, of you know, how do experts with, jargon, with their jargon-filled documents, um, you know, with their quantitative analysis, actually going to communicate these results in a way that is effective um, to the agency head and that's more likely to occur with centralized models, again, relative to more separated models, which look more like what I'm calling static consultation. Okay, again, it's this 200-page report that lands, and you know, the agency head just doesn't really know what to do with it, you know, thinks it's interesting maybe, but um, it's not really, again, absorbed um, as an institutional matter. Okay, I won't say much about these because I've already given you examples of different procedural choices that agency heads can make. They can standardize um, different aspects of the cost-benefit analysis through guidance documents. We see the EPA increasingly doing this. 
They can set priorities in particular ways, depending on um, the different uncertainties that are involved. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission, for example, has a priority system that I understand is um, keyed to its assessment of different um, uncertainties and probabilities of harm. And then finally, as I alluded to with uh, the chief economist sign-off, the agency head can also design clearance procedures that will incorporate particular kinds of information. So whereas before, again, the chief economist wasn't a part of the rulemaking process, um, now they are. Similarly, too, um, the agency head can also cut out particular constituencies within the agency if they think that it shouldn't actually be um, a factor in the final decision. Um, in terms of the kind of information that the agency is going to require under conditions of deep uncertainty, okay, that is to actually successfully get the regulation um, through judicial review and a wire review, um, you're going to need lawyers, okay, because they need to interpret the statute, right, and be able to tell the agency head um, whether a particular decision-making approach is required. Okay, so for example, the Food Safety Modernization Act, you know, arguably can be interpreted to require a precautionary approach. So you'll need um, lawyers to um, give you that kind of information. And then, of course, there's arbitrary and capricious judicial review, okay, where we, we, we will learn that um, at the Supreme Court level, that seems to be um, often formulated in what Adrian and, and Jay Gerson are calling thin rationality review. Um, and the sort of uh, flag bearer for that principle is a case called Baltimore Gas. Um, alternatively, um, the lawyers might also inform the agency head of the risks of the actual application of hard look review, what's traditionally known as uh, a much more um, stringent form of judicial review, which might be less of a concern um, at the Supreme Court level, although more of a concern at the D.C. Circuit level. Finally, in terms of um, presidential and a wire review, okay, a wire doesn't actually require any quantification in these circumstances. Okay, circular A4, which is what governs the cost-benefit analysis process, it's the main guidance document that OIRA um, relies upon, says that, look, in some cases, the level of scientific uncertainty may be so large that the agency can only present discrete alternative scenarios without assessing the relative likelihood of each scenario quantitatively. They can only do that qualitatively, okay, and that's fine for OIRA's purposes. Okay, what is scenario analysis? Well, they're essentially qualitative snapshots of alternative scenarios of the future, okay? They're not predictions that just extrapolate from the present, and we're seeing agencies actually use this type of scenario analysis. Um, I, these are all hyperlinked, you know, take for example the National Park Service um, actually has a, a number of climate change scenario matrices which you can look at, and so this is, you know, a real thing that agencies are engaging in. And um, finally, let me just suggest that in terms of the structural model that might be appropriate for scenario analysis in particular um, is the centralization of the scenario analysts with the decision makers. Because one way to understand this approach is as a form of deliberation with analysis. Okay? And these uh, require, um, I argue, uh, inherently political judgments because by definition, right, expert elicited information is not going to resolve the uncertainty. And one example of this, potentially, I'm curious to see if it's actually working, um, is the Cross EPA Workgroup on Climate Change Adaptation. It's chaired by the EPA Senior Climate Change Adaptation Official. It'd probably better if it was, you know, chaired and taken ownership by, by um, the administrator um, herself. But this group basically includes representatives from each of EPA's environmental program offices and potentially allows for more of this deliberation with analysis. So let me just end with some other potential discussion questions. Uh, the first is, how much can and should agency heads standardize approaches to uncertainty analysis, maybe to ameliorate some of these problems of expertise translation? Finally, to what extent should uncertainty analyses always be subject to review by the highest level political appointee. Okay, how much should we structurally accept them to take ownership for the decisions that result? Thanks. So man, I hope I have time to get to my slides because it takes us on a slightly different track, but I did want to sort of cover uh, Jennifer's paper, which I thought was excellent. To be perfectly honest, when I first read the title and, and understood what the topic was, I kind of wondered at first, why would we get into this topic so much and shouldn't we really worry about the analysis? 
but frankly, uh, the paper opened my eyes a lot. And I think what Jennifer gone through is almost a public choice theory of um, how we make decisions under deep uncertainty and institutional arrangements, legal arrangements, et cetera. It was quite excitement, exciting to get into that. So um, there are lots of papers on technical treatment of deep uncertainty, but I found very little in the, in the research, published literature on, on this topic. So it's a great addition and a great extension to go to. I think it is a huge deal, for not just for EPA, but for uh, regulatory decisions in general. Contrary to some of the stuff that we heard this morning, I don't believe it's really easy to revisit regulations. Um, actually, quite difficult. Um, just take an example of the costs. A lot of, at least in EPA's land, a lot of the costs are capital costs of a regulation. So if we put on a law requiring selective catalytic reductions on electric utilities, the idea that then we would, four years later, turn around and say, oops, we were wrong. We got that wrong. You no longer have to have them. Well, 80% of the cost are the, is the equipment itself. And so, um, in fact, there is a case where the courts remanded that rule back to us. And so a lot of these SCRs are sitting idle, and they would be an extremely cost-effective now. So the marginal cost of running those things compared to the benefits is, is the costs are dwarfed. The marginal costs are dwarfed. So it does make a difference of getting it right the first time as opposed to revisiting a few years down the road. Um, that's sort of issue one. The other is sort of the, um, I'm not a lawyer, I'm an economist, but there are anti-backsliding provisions in various statutes, and I know that that's been an obstacle in the past for some of our things, so that would be something else I would be concerned about. Um, let's see. Uh, so when we do have uh, conflicting regulation, it can make a huge difference, too, just on the decision outcome. If you look at arsenic, for example, we regulated arsenic on the drinking water program where the epidemiology uh, played a major role in determining what the risks were and therefore the benefits. If you look at the animal studies, you come away with a very different uh, result. So um, and arsenic turns out to be a, um, uh, a fungicide as well in the pesticide program. So you can come up with even inconsistencies across programs very easily when there's deep uncertainty. And of course, it's the whole transparency thing too. So if we're masking the deep uncertainty and how we deal with it, we might be hiding uh, our thought processes, et cetera. Um, one thing that I really liked in Jennifer's paper is that she introduces this notion that laws and executive orders can really have a tremendous impact on how the agencies deal with deep uncertainty. Um, I, uh, think that this paper raises a number of hypotheses that I would sort of urge Jennifer to sort of go further with them and talk about why they mattered and what are the unanswered issues in those. Um, I can, I'm going to go into some examples. Uh, Jennifer mentioned in the paper, we use an OSHA example on the court side where the court says you have to demonstrate that you exceed a sort of hazard threshold before you regulate a chemical, and that may in fact produce some perverse incentives for the agency then to, to quantify things when they're not exactly sure. Um, I have two other examples. One is TOSCA Section 6. I don't know if people know that rule, but that's a rule that actually requires benefit cost analysis. And indeed, the judge, uh, we haven't used that law, or that's part of the rule to regulate existing chemicals since 1991. We tried to regulate asbestos and courts remanded it back to us. And here's what they said about unquantified benefits. Um, unquantified benefits can, at times, permissibly tip the balance in close cases. They cannot, however, be used to affect a wholesale shift on the balance beam. Such a use makes a mockery of the requirements of TSCA that the EPA weigh the cost of its actions before it chooses the least burdensome alternative. So what he's saying is that Unquantified benefits can at best be a thumb on the scale. It can't be the basis for a decision making. So that's sort of one law that we're working under. And it's sort of interesting, I think, that EPA hasn't used it since this decision was uh, handed down in the um, corrosion proof fittings. Contrast that to the Clean Air Act when we set national ambient air quality standards. There the law says <coughs> national ambient air quality standards prescribed under subsection A shall be ambient air quality standards the attainment and maintenance of which, in the judgment of the administrator, based on such criteria and allowing an adequate margin of safety, are requisite to protect the public health. And clearly, with a broad uh, 
mandate like that, you can the administrator is free to account for uncertainty, however she wishes, however she deems best to do so. Um, the point is, I think that those two statutory directions lead to very different ways we incorporate uncertainty in Jennifer's sort of uh, modeling of centralization versus um, decentralization versus outside. Indeed, in the Clean Air Act, we have a um, Clean Air Science Advisory Committee, an outside panel of experts that advises the administrator on what are protective levels of air quality, whether it be ozone, particulate matter, uh, carbon monoxide, et cetera. So there's a case where they're in the business of actually advising the administrator on what's an adequate margin of safety. Um, part of that is a bit troublesome to me because they're taking a policy content, I think, and as outside scientists making not just a, an informed policy call, perhaps because they are scientists, but a policy call nonetheless about what is adequate. Um, let's see. So I, I want to get to uh, also to Jennifer's point about how does EPA handle all this. I'm very flattered that she sort of put me as sort of the centralized National Center for Environmental Economics is charged with handling all the uh, uncertainty assessments. In truth, we do, as uh, alluded to earlier in the question, that my center does um, review almost every RIA that comes through the agency, provided there's enough time, et cetera. But we don't necessarily, um, our model, working model, is that we actually use a hybrid screen. We work with the program offices on particularly difficult problems, but um, in general, the program office is responsible for producing their regulatory analysis to support their rulemakings, and we're sort of a, uh, an asset to be used with them or to help them, and it's certainly in a sort of peer review mode internally before we send things to OIRA. Um, so maybe that hybrid model needs to be explored, and I think that's actually probably a dominant model in government as well. So um, that would be an important thing to do. Um, but we should look deeper, I think, in how agencies deal with uncertainty, and there's several ways we do it. My office also puts out the economic guidelines for EPA on how to deal with uh, new economic analysis, and there there are discussions about uncertainty. So whether it be discount rates, although OMB also mandates certain use of discount rates, which are clearly uncertain, the value of a statistical life, clearly an uncertain number. My office generates the estimates for that and has them peer reviewed, and the entire agency uses the same values. But in addition to that, there's a lot of work on the risk side where science policy decisions get embedded or embodied in uh, risk assessment procedures. So there's a lot of policy in our science. We call, I call it science policy. So whether it be the uncertainty factors when we're extrapolating from animal studies to human does response stuff, even the policy of what health effects to quantify. You may be familiar with reference doses or reference concentrations or acceptable daily intakes. That is a sort of made up concept of how much can I, we be exposed to and still be at sort of safe levels and above which we just say we're not sure we're safe or you're not safe. We don't really say what the risks are. Economists have a hard time dealing with that in a benefit context. We don't, um, we really would like probabilities, uh, those response curves, if you will. But that's a major aspect of like a safe harbor for uh, EPA toxicologists, et cetera. The other thing I think is we differentiate between hazard assessment and risk assessment. So hazard assessment is coming up with the dose response curve or a relationship between um, how much exposure creates a hazard. So a reference, deriving a reference dose. That is typically done in our IRIS program, the Integrated Risk Information System. Uh, that is done in the Office of Research and Development. So that's kind of a centralized risk estimate. But those risk, those hazard assessments are then applied on a regulation. And there's a lot of science policy that goes into those. We once joked about, um, and then some of that is depends on the way the law is written. So we once coined a frame of a porch potato because it had to be a protected standard for hazardous air pollutants. So we actually made up a, guy, a person who lives on a porch next to a, uh, an oil refinery, and he sits on that porch 24-7. So um, of course that wouldn't exist, but it, the way the law instructed us is to set this stringent level with an adequate margin of safety, that was the way the scientists came up with a way of quantifying that. Um, let's see, there are um, other examples of um, We even use different air quality models depending on um, the nature of the problem and how certain we want to be of the results. So in 
might be a simple model or it might be uh, ones that are based on supercomputers. Um, and we can take different runs at that. There is missing data, there's sensitive populations, do you want to come for them or not? And target your risk estimate to the sensitive population to the general population. Um, and then there are, of course, even judgments about what to quantify. So um, uh, when you look at animal studies in particular, there's a lot of uh, effects, health endpoints, that are hard for economists to take into account. Is your liver uh, getting bigger, uh, significant, or frank effect that we need to be worried about as opposed to um, you know, getting cancer, which is a little easier to comprehend. So there's a whole range of these kinds of things that we have to take in. Another example would be the two liter per day uh, assumption in the drinking water program. That's, again, a sort of safe or precautionary assumption. It has a good basis and, and a long history, and no one really challenges it anymore, but it's a heuristic for how we go about doing things. Um, so I think in sort of short, the way at least EPA is organized, there's sort of a hybrid of ways things we, we do. Some are centralized, and we would never uh, want to go against uh, everyone else is using the same value of a, a mortality risk reduction or the same uh, cancer risk for you know, trichloroethylene, um, even though that might be regulated in three or four different offices. But the exposure modeling and the other kinds of things it, um, that sort of drill down into a particular regulation are typically very program specific and do get reviewed. I do want to go, if I have time, to, uh, to talk about this example. So this is how we do benefit analysis. So it's a sort of standard thing, and you have policy options. There's a fair amount of economics and engineering uh, thinking about how that policy options would change em emissions or stressors into the environment. Of course, then they take that and model that through a fate and transport model. And again, that's a science policy decision, too, how detailed and how much we want to do there. That maps into changes in environmental quality. And there we get exposure changes, which also includes some behavioral assumptions about people's response to the changes in the environment. And then where we apply risk changes by applying those response changes, the changes in values. And finally, we uh, we produce uh, evaluations of those risk changes, how much are people willing to pay for those changes, and we get benefits for that change. So um, if we don't have those response changes, if we just have the acceptable daily intake reference concentration stuff, we're generally out of business, right? There has yet to been a published paper it takes those numbers and proves some benefits with them. So I don't know what we would do there. Um, but what I want to say is, uh, it, uh, Jennifer's pay, uh, talk sort of transitioned more to this. I think benefit cost analysis is still the dominant analytic paradigm for regulatory dis, uh, you know, decision making, not uh, other forms. And so while OIRA may say they are OK with scenario development, I really don't think that they're, that's sort of viewed by the agencies as, uh, as truth. So um, there is a word in that. Um, truth in the sense that they would accept that analysis, but that means if the benefits don't get into the uh, benefit cost equation because it's in the scenario analysis, you know, outside of that, how much would that get counted? And, uh, you know, they still produce that report to Congress, for example, with the famous table of all the benefits and costs, et cetera. So, um, I'm all for the scenario analysis, and we do do it. We actually do a variation of that. We call it a break-even analysis if we don't know the frequency. So if we're looking at there's a that fertilizer explosion in Texas, um, we're looking at ways to uh, lower the probability of those kinds of accidents. There's no way to predict exactly how many of these measures will, these accidents will be prevented, but we can at least think about, well, if we prevent a half an accident a year, we will have uh, benefits equal to cost. So that, I think break-even analysis, very popular at Homeland Security and uh, very popular for certain programs in EPA as well. Um, but benefit cost analysis is sort of the name of the game. Um, and that has given rise, both here but it's in EPA, about vigorous debates about how far to go when you want to quantify benefits. And I have an example, which I kind of want to get to. This is sort of a standard approach, right? So if you have quantified benefits, that are less than the true benefits because you don't bother to quantify. You, as pointed out in the earlier session, you can get a result that's suboptimal. Um, this is a real example, not that unrecent actually. You might have seen an article uh, as well in the New York Times about it. Um, so the red line is the cost of removing formaldehyde and Presswood products. I can use this example um, because um, this was a case where California, we, 
would normally regulate formaldehyde under Section 6 of TOSCA, but, but since we haven't used it since 1991, we actually did do an RIA once for this, but never never got out of the agency. Um, California went ahead and regulated it themselves, and then industry uh, approached Congress about passing a rule so that they could work with a national standard for pressed wood. So, uh, Congress passed a rule instructing us to adopt the California standard, which we did. So that benefit cost analysis in this case really didn't play a role in the decision making. There are some uh, differences in the enforcement provisions, etc. But um, but what I want to say though is um, the blue line or the top line, solid line, is with the asthma. There's a literature, it's about six or seven articles that show an association between formaldehyde exposure to kids and getting asthma. So if you value asthma and the lifelong consequences that come from avoiding uh, getting asthma when you're a kid, you can get some really big benefit numbers, and that chart shows that adequately. If you leave the asthma stuff out because it's these are just simple odd ratios. The epidemiology is not very good. It's not well reported. We couldn't get standard errors. It was uh, abysmal, and frankly, from uh, <laughs> trying to contact the authors and getting their data and stuff. Um, but we tried really hard. Didn't get quite enough. There's a couple studies that don't show any association. So it's a very noisy kind of signal. Um, so if you take them out, which is ultimately what prevailed, you end up with the dotted line. And, at no point does the quantified benefits exceed the quantified costs in that context. This was just the final table, which illustrates the same thing. So we're trying to start a, an effort within the agency. We call it risk assessment for benefit analysis. We're trying to get risk assessors, the people that do the dose response stuff, to sort of appreciate that economists need something like a dose response curve to work with and certain on endpoints that we can work with. So if you ever, uh, this is a book I would recommend. It was chaired by Tom Burke, who's actually our current science advisor, professor at Johns Hopkins. But chapter five of that actually says, think about the questions you're, you know, and decisions you have to make before you do the risk assessment, and design the risk assessment to help you answer the questions that decision makers have. Don't answer questions that you want to answer, answer the questions that are have. Um, it lays out a whole framework. It's quite unusual for an NAS study to be that specific. But the point is then it would allow economists to get these sort of better defined things that might be more feasible to implement some of the proposals we heard today. So I'll stop there. Uh, I'm here wearing two hats. Uh, one is having served uh, as the chief of staff of the federal EPA early in the Clinton administration. And, uh, and that probably will mostly inform the reactions I have. I don't have slides. I just want to say a few words about what I thought was a really interesting paper. Uh, the, the second is uh, that I am uh, the, uh, a professor at Vanderbilt Law School and the director of the Climate Change Research Network. And maybe this says a little bit about my view about the importance or non-importance of government evaluations of uncertainty for catastrophic problems and that I don't work on government solutions to problems anymore. Uh, I'm focused on private governance. Uh, and the role that private institutions can play in addressing market failures and behavioral failures to try to buy time on climate change. And I spend almost all my time on those, on those projects. So anyway, uh, here's what I understand uh, this paper to be doing, uh, to, to essentially be saying that uncertainty-based decisions uh, demand uh, uh, distinct considerations of institutional design, uh, and to focus on organizational units, and, and also on rulemaking in particular. I want to get all back to all of that, if I may. Uh, obviously, we've heard already the, the recommendation here is formal scenario analysis uh, and doing that within a centralized unit within EPA on the theory that a centralized unit will more efficiently, more effectively manage that uh, formal scenario analysis. Uh, paper uses climate change as an example uh, and specifically points to the work group that, that, uh, that we just talked about on adaptation. Uh, and so I want to start with, with what I like about the paper, which is quite a bit. Um, and a first point, um, as Al mentioned, is simply calling attention to the idea that the internal organizations and operations of agencies matter. They certainly do in my experience uh, at, at EPA and the analysis I've done since leaving the agency. Uh, I would suggest that maybe we could go a step further with that. Uh, the paper focuses on rulemaking, which is a natural instinct. Uh, I work, again, in interdisciplinary groups all the time. When I work with sociologists, everything starts with the group. 
Uh, when I work with economists, it starts with, with, with money uh, and markets. And when I work with lawyers, it's always about law. And we all think that what we're working on drives everything else. Uh, and for administrative lawyers, it's about rulemaking. Uh, but my experience in the agency uh, suggests that there are many things the agencies do that don't involve rulemaking that are incredibly important. Uh, whether it's enforcement, grant making, the provision of services, et cetera, and that all these things are affected by deep uncertainty uh, as well. And so I would just suggest that we move beyond what, what we're comfortable with in the administrative law area into the other functions that agencies uh, perform and, and how deep uncertainty affects them uh, as well. Uh, I think this is a point that could more generally be pursued in administrative law, and it's an area of opportunity. Uh, a second part that I like in the paper is the, the analysis and contrasting between distributed and centralized authority uh, within the agency. And I'll say more about that in a moment. Uh, but for now, my suggestion is uh, to run with this idea, not to assume that a centralized approach is necessarily more effective or more efficient, but rather to study that as a phenomenon in and of itself. I think there's a lot more that could be done on that. And let me just give you one example, again, from my own experience. Um, uh, and, and that's a, a, a not involving deep uncertainty, but involving concentrated versus distributed authority uh, within, and personnel within the agency. So when I arrived at the agency, um, and Al or Dick may have different views on this, I'd be interested in your comments on this, uh, having worked within the agency. Uh, but the rumor was that during the Gorsuch administration, the enforcement staff had been separated. So all the engineers were put back into their program offices, and the lawyers remained in, in a centralized unit. On the theory, again, this is the rumor, um, and Don may have views on this too. He's closer to it uh, the early years than I was. Uh, on the theory that that would make coordination more difficult, uh, it would make the, the, conf the confrontation or conflict avoidance instincts of the engineers more prominent and ultimately slow down enforcement. Now, I don't know whether that was true or not, uh, but, but that was the, the thought. And so what did we do? Well, of course, we reorganized the enforcement program. We had a team, uh, can't do that with one person, two dozen people working for two years and reassembled the enforcement program. I would be interested in whether that worked. It's something of a natural experiment. We had a period in the agency where we had uh, centralized enforcement up until the early 80s, then decentralized for a period of roughly a decade, and then centralized again. What, what happened within the agency? I think that's worth studying, and that might begin to show us some Thing about whether centralized or, or decentralizing um, uh, scenario analysts might be, might be a smart approach or not. Uh, so that, those are some of the things that I like quite a bit about the paper. Uh, and I also agree that the idea of using scenario analysis is one of the few available options when we're dealing with deep uncertainty. Um, I do have an opposite instinct, however, about whether centralization is the right idea. Again, I think this is something worth studying. Um, I work with, uh, again, teams of, of social psychologists and others, and when I talked to them about this idea, their concern was the group think, think concerns that you might imagine when you get this, a group of analysts all working together. Uh, they emphasize the need to try to make sure that we have people from different disciplines in that group if it were to be formed. But also something I hadn't thought of, which is that if you centralize these individuals in one organization, we quickly identify group identification, and we tend to reject the outputs of groups that are not our own. And so that one option, one concern here is that even within EPA, if we centralize everyone, even if Al runs the, the group, if we centralize everyone in one office, that the other program offices may be less likely to, to accept their inputs, or at least we have to account for and control for that a little bit. Um, I suppose most importantly, uh, my question uh, is, uh, is whether or not we're grappling with the most important question. And to me, the most important question is not just the existence of uncertainty on what I think of as the smaller risks that we might deal with out there, whether it's an air toxic uh, under the HAP program under Section 112 or something under TSCA, but it's the truly catastrophic problems. Uh, uh, Dan had a catastrophic paper, uh, or paper, I'm sorry, title catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> I promised I would uh, try to keep you awake a little bit. Uh, but uh, uh, in his paper, he identifies the kinds of catastrophes I think many of us think about a lot, the long-term storage of nuclear waste, and of course, climate is the one that I think about, the financial crisis, et cetera. And, uh, and to me, the largest challenge is to think about how, if we're going to do scenario analysis, how we include in that range of scenarios the truly worst case scenarios. We have a deep tendency to think of those as alarmist on some level. And I've seen that in play. I think many of us have. We saw it, I think, with, uh, with the thinking that didn't go in to the analysis before uh, the Deepwater Horizon as well. 
Uh, I don't think that, that tendency toward over-optimism is going to change anytime soon. The unwillingness to buy insurance against problems until we've actually experienced the harms or the catastrophe in some form. And so what we need to do is design structures that account for that, whether it's in scenario analysis or something else. Um, so uh, so I, I, let me turn lastly then to, to the larger project. Um, and there is an assumption embedded in the paper that if we get the EPA structure right, we will deal with uncertainty uh, well or better. And my question for deep uncertainty related to catastrophic risks is whether EPA really matters. And, uh, and I hate to say that as a former EPA chief of staff, uh, but to me, the question on these major catastrophic issues of deep uncertainty is when the meeting is over and everyone leaves the room, who stays in the room with the President of the United States? So for the questions of deep uncertainty, the issue really is a small group of people uh, and what their views are and how they inform the large allocations of political capital and other choices that are made at a core level. And I think the best thing that we can do as we think about deep uncertainty is to think about what agencies can do to generate the right kinds of information to ensure that the people who are in that place, and I must tell you that it's never the EPA chief of staff in my experience. Uh, it's very often not even the cabinet secretary. It's a much smaller group than that. But they need to be armed with the information necessary to make wise choices in the long run. And our focus, from my perspective, if we truly want to have long-term effects, as to these catastrophic problems that involve deep uncertainty, is to think who is the real decision maker, uh, what type of information and in what format is only actually going to enable them to make these kinds of wise judgments, and then what kind of process we can use to get from here to there. Uh, and, uh, and for that, I don't have an easy answer on that. Um, and uh, I do think that quantified estimates are quite valuable, and I think the kind of scenario analysis that Jennifer's talking about makes a, a lot of sense. I do think that there are times when narrative descriptions of what the potential outcomes might be in 100 or 200 years even if they aren't attached to, uh, to quantified estimates of costs and benefits, might be quite valuable as well. It might enable people to envision what the future looks like in ways that are hard to do uh, when we're simply thinking about numbers. Um, I also think that, uh, that a process that involves not just focusing on one specific uh, potentially catastrophic issue that, that involves deep uh, uncertainty might be to look across different issues and to generate a report on an annual basis. I have a paper with a physicist Jonathan Gilligan where we argue we need to be thinking about these in context so we're not choosing just one catastrophic, potentially uh, catastrophic issue that involves deep uncertainty but across many different ones, climate, financial, nuclear waste, nuclear war, asteroids, whatever they might be. Uh, and yet, uh, with the exception potentially of national security kinds of briefings that I'm not privy to, I don't see that discussion going on uh, in the public uh, marketplace of ideas. I don't see the president getting that kind of information. And I think one of the things we might try to think about is what kinds of, what's the locus for the generation of that kind of information and what should the shape of it be if what we want to do is to try to actually influence the core decision makers. Uh, and again, as to the current location, uh, for the preparation of that information. I'm going to defer to what Dan mentioned earlier, which is every researcher's great last phrase, which is more research is needed. So uh, thank you very much.